Hello, in today's video from Up Level Academy, we're going to be looking at your ability to infer. Now, this is an important skill and one that many students seem to struggle with. And it's because the idea of being able to read in between the lines, being able to decipher what the writer is implying can seem quite daunting, especially when it's with unseen extracts, for example, in language or even in literature, because you may have studied these texts and so feel a bit of pressure to make insightful um, inferences. However, um, this is a skill that you use every single day without realizing it. So let me give you an example. Have you ever had the experience where you've asked someone how they're doing? So you might have said, how are you today? And they've responded, I'm fine. Now, literally, they said, I'm fine, which means that they're okay. But what can we infer? What can we tell by the tonality of their voice? Well, that they're not okay. And we know that because of the tone, the manner in which they've said something. And so that is really what we're doing with our texts. Now, this is an important skill for all the exam boards, whether you're doing AQA, Edexcel, Educast, OCR, WJEC, um, CCEA, IGCC Cambridge, or Edexcel, it doesn't matter. This is an important skill that you will need to use in language and in literature. Now, in language paper two, especially, this is really important um, because there are questions whereby you have to make points, you must use evidence, and you must infer. And it's not asking you to analyze, this is particularly, to you for, particularly true for AQA language paper two, um, where you have to summarize um, the differences or similarities. You have to compare the viewpoints of two writers. And it's also true in Edexcel for question 7a. So let's have a look. And, and as I said as well, actually, I want to make it, make it clear that for those questions, of course, you are only inferring, so you're not analyzing, but um, you still want to make insightful inferences, you know, for the longer answered questions um, and even for the language question as well. So it is an important skill and it is important for all of the exam boards. It's just about making sure that you understand the question and what's being asked of you. And for literature, it's essential. So let me share my screen with you all. And we will get started. So how to make insightful inferences. So I love the iceberg analogy. An iceberg is a huge block of ice, essentially. And you can see the tip of it, right? And that's what we call the explicit, the obvious um, happenings, the obvious meaning. But if we look below the surface, that is what we can imply. It's the implicit meaning. And this is where we have to infer. And to help us to infer, we can look at the connotations of words, phrases, imagery. And then we want to look at the effect, the impact on the reader or the audience. And so these are five steps that you can use to help you. So step one, before you even attempt at you know, making inferences, you need to understand oh, what is going on, what is happening in the text, obviously, like, on the surface level, because only by knowing that and understanding that are you going to be able to successfully make inferences. You need to know what the writer's overall attitude and purpose is. So what is their attitude on the topic, the issue or the theme? And what's their purpose? Are they trying to entertain, argue, persuade? What is their intentions? And you need to consider the tone of the piece as well. Is it critical? Is it satirical? What is the tone? And then you need to think about the connotations of the words. So these are like the word associations, the thoughts and feelings that arise. And then what is the effect on you, the reader? How does it make you feel? Okay. And a great way to remember it is inferring equals clues from the text. So you must base it on the text and then your own experiences. Okay. And I'd invite you to write this down and even draw the image of the iceberg. The reason being is it will help you to memorize it so that you're able to, to use it, which is the most important thing. So 
Let's put this into practice with this first task. So this is from a language paper too. So what can we infer from this extract? So we don't know anything else. We're just looking at this paragraph in isolation. Of course, you would want to make sure that you read uh, what the passage is about and read everything. But let's just look at this to show you how you can infer. So what was not known, however, was that the newest tip, number seven, was a killer with a rotten heart. It had been begun in Easter 1958 and was built on a mountain spring, most treacherous of all foundations. Gradually over the years, the fatal seeping of water was turning tip seven into a mountain of moving muck. So what can we infer from this? So again, using those five, those five steps, step one, well, what is obviously going on here? So here, the writer is informing us about number seven, tip number seven. We learn that it is one of the newest ones there. We learn when it had begun. We learn about the foundation, we learn about the foundations and that the foundations are insecure to say the least. And then we've learned that actually um, because of um, the seeping of water, it has made it even more unsturdy. Okay, that's explicitly what is going on. So what is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose is maybe to inform us of what is happening or what happened, the tragedy that happened. But what else is going on? What else is the purpose, do you think? And the clues are within the words and phrases that they are using, because there are a lot of loaded words and phrases here. Because if it was just informing us, then perhaps it would be more factual. But if we look here, we've got killer, rotten heart, this personification of tip number seven, calling it a killer. Well, that suggests that perhaps the writer's tone here is of anger, and maybe their purpose is to, yes, inform us, but also to show and highlight how actually this tragedy should never have ha had happened. It should never have happened, that this tragedy could have been avoided, which makes it all the more poignant, okay? Um, we've got treacherous, fatal, and we've got this alliteration of moving muck. Okay, so now then, what can we look at next? Well, once we've looked at what's explicitly happening, we looked at the purpose and we started to look at the tone. You can see how they actually, um, by breaking it down, it helps you to naturally do that. We now need to think about, well, okay, what are the connotations of these words? So for killer, the connotations are of a murderer, something deliberate, deliberate, intentional action to cause harm. And then rotten heart, well, what are the connotations of rotten? Well, there are quite a few, aren't there? So rotten, some of the connotations of rotten could be of um, decay and death, which could foreshadow what's going to happen, the events that are about to, to unfold. But it also could have connotations of wickedness, evil. And again, it helps to heighten the idea of tip number seven being um, this, this killer, something monstrous. And I would also look at actually newest. What are the connotations of newest? Well, I don't know about you, but if I think of something new, I think of something innovative, um, something um, better than something that's old, something that's been made redundant. So with newest, this superlative, superlative is when you have like the, the most of something. So it typically ends in EST. So here the newest. Well, the connotations of that are perhaps something innovative, something better. However, when juxtaposed with killer and rotten, it heightens the fact that actually this is a terrible tip to say the least, right? Does that make sense? And then treacherous, treacherous, Treachery has connotations of betrayal, right? So again, it helps to create this image of tip number seven being um, a traitor to the inhabitants here in Abafan. Does that make sense? So can you see what we're doing here? Okay. And it works not only for, as I said, language papers one and two, and for focusing on two, as I said, because 
um, there's questions there which only ask you to infer that you want to be doing this, as I said, with all of the questions where appropriate. We can also use it for poetry. So this is an example from one of my favorite poets, Seamus Heaney, um, it's midterm break. So if we have a look here, it says, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. He lay in the four foot box as in his cot, no gaudy scars, the bumper knocked him clear. A four foot box, a foot for every year. So again, what is explicitly happening? Well, here we have um, a voice describing the death of his younger brother. And we can infer that they're four because of the emphasis and repetition on four. Um, and we get the sense that they were hit by a car. How do I know this? Well, it doesn't say exactly a car knocked him down or run him over. It says the bumper knocked him clear. So this word bumper, again, we can use our knowledge of where we see bumpers. You see them in the front of cars, right? And then knocked, this word knocked, knocked down, but knocked down. Yeah, so can you see how here we can infer, we can infer that the younger brother was um, sadly um, hit by a car and was killed. Okay, and then again, inferring the child's age because of the repetition of four, the fact that it's like a cot, so it seems quite a young child, not a baby as such, right? Okay, and then what is the, the writer's attitude and their tone? Well, their tone seems very angry, because, particularly because of this last line. It's standalone, so it emphasizes it. Um, and the, you know, the fact that it's, it's closed as well here with the full stop, that doesn't, he doesn't use enjambment, really emphasizes this idea of this child's life being cut short, okay? Because we've got this end stop here. Um, the fricative alliteration with the F sounds sounds like he's spitting out his words. So there's, there's an anger here. And then what is the purpose? Well, again, there's some clues, poppy bruise, poppy is a very evocative um, adjective to use here because of the connotations of poppy. Poppy, poppies are associated with remembering um, the soldiers from, World War I, World War II in particular, right? So it maybe indicates Seamus Heaney's attitude that while his baby brother may not be remembered and revered as everyone else, that for him, this death is as significant as that. And it's a way to commemorate his baby brother and the impact of his death on himself and his family without um, trying to you know, sugarcoat it, so being raw with it. Does that make sense? So can you see here again, we can work out the poets, in this case, intentions by looking at what can we infer? And we can infer by looking at well, what are the connotations? What outside knowledge do I have? And then basing it in the extract. So we'll stop there. So do make sure that, of course, you like, share and subscribe to the channel. Um, feel free to leave comments below or any questions. And we look forward to uploading more English tips for you. Bye for now.